are indeed going to talk about identifying funding sources. What are they? How might you choose how to fund your business? And what are alternatives to equity, among other things? Um, and to take us through this session is Michael Shemtoff, the owner and founder of Butcher and the Bee, the daily red-headed stranger, and the upcoming Fancy Pants. Uh, he has opened many restaurants between Atlanta, Charleston, and Nashville. His flagship restaurant, Butcher and Bee, was nominated for James Beard Award for Outstanding Restaurant. He's a proud graduate of the James E. Cleburne Political Fellowship Program, the board chair for Paid Forward Charleston, a founding member of the Independent Restaurant Coalition, and an advisor to the James Beard Foundation. And for those of you who have gone through well, you know that Michael has been extremely generous with all of us um, through the attending, each, presenting during each session. So without further ado, Michael Shantab. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I um, uh, appreciate. Um, I will. I'm not sure why it's going on, okay. so give me one second. Um, yeah, appreciate the audience. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on a panel with Stephanie uh, for well uh, about a year ago, and I was so impressed with her. Going after her is challenging. I was so impressed with her, I just scrapped my notes, and I spent like my 15 minutes just <laughs> underscoring things that she said that I thought were so brilliant. Um, and now she's our CPA, so um, uh, which I think is like the best way to make the networking point here. Um, anything that you want to chat about on the break, at lunch, after, I'm going to be like here for all of it. I'm going to be around tomorrow. Uh, we have two sessions today that I've been invited to speak on. Uh, the first one's about identifying sources of capital. Uh, and the second one is about sort of perspectives on deal making. And there's some similarities between the two. They also, if we get the presentation up, you will see how dramatically different a presentation from a restaurateur looks than a presentation from an accounting <laughs> firm. Um, so it uh, should be fun. But um, yeah, I think my, um, just a couple, just two things to open with um, while we see if we can get this going. If not, uh, no biggie. But um, uh, every, cook wants to be a chef and most chefs that I know just want to go back to being a cook and it's the same thing with restaurateurs right most of restaurateurs that have one they want to have five or ten or fifty or be nationwide and most of us that have gotten to five or ten just really want to go back to expediting and working the host stand and so uh, I think twice we've heard this point about defining your North Star like knowing what you are what you want to do and I've got it like five slides or six slides into my deck as well uh, but I just think that's so important uh, to really just think about. So I mean, I don't know that you stop and have that meditation right now. Uh, I think you know, absorb the next two days. But really, I, th I would say one of the takeaways is just be very clear after this about what you actually want to do. Uh, and I think that there's a certain beauty to having one and being really successful at it. And I'll just say we went to dinner at um, Sofra in Brooklyn the other night, and the seam, the owner, was like there she was there at 8 a.m. she was there at 8 p.m. she was working the floor and there was she just got so much out of it it seemed now in a sense you might end up buying yourself a job I'm not talking about Nassim and so forth, which is a great restaurant highly recommend you eat there but I'm not talking about that I'm just talking about you gotta be comfortable with that like when people tell me they want to open a food truck or a bakery I'm like awesome if you want to be a baker for the rest of your life open a bakery like if you actually want to build a business and you want to be a business person that's the last thing you should do um, it's working Oh. Which is the one on the left. This one? Yes, correct. There we go. Perfect. All right. Um, OK, so uh, I was born in Israel. Uh, the banking system was quite different there. Uh, my dad, when we got to the States, said that in the States, the only way to get a loan is to prove you don't need it. Um, which is very true. Uh, so we're going to talk about, uh, I just, that, that to me was like, that basically sums up. I mean, I think you said it too, banks come to you when, they don't, when you don't need money. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to get to is this sort of, uh, what I think is like the ideal scenario for raising money for a restaurant. But uh, there's sort of four buckets for sources of capital. So you got banks, investors, uh, partners and non-traditional lenders, investor debt would just be debt, but coming from an investor rather than a bank. Um, you know, some kind of high level points. So uh, an investor, any sophisticated investor, we're going to talk about the people who are just investing emotionally because they love you, they love your story. Those are wonderful people to partner with. Uh, but anybody who's looking at it, uh, like Ita is an equity investor. Um, 
is going to want somewhere around 15% return. I mean, they could get 13 to 15 to 17% in real estate, so why would they go something as risky as a restaurant when they could get a higher return? So they're going to be looking for that maybe more, and they're going to be looking for that forever. Banks are going to want you to pay them back in five or seven years. They're looking for closer to 8% than 6%. This is, those notes are slightly old from when interest rates were a little bit lower. Um, but after five or seven years, they go away. So I've always preferred that. Um, same thing with LLs as landlords. Like a lot of people think, oh, my landlord is going to give me a bunch of money. Your landlord has an internal rate of return that they're modeling to. They're trying to make 11, 13, 17%. Every dollar they give you, they're going to want that repaid back at that rate. Uh, uh, occasionally, you'll find a landlord that has some bigger calculation, like you are helping them lease up all their apartments above. So there might be some there might be some wiggle room. These are not like hard rules, but that's just generally the way you think about it. Um, further from a traditional loan, the higher the rates will go. Um, so the sort of lowest rates are really with banks, and then once you get outside of banks to like community lenders uh, or private lenders, rates will get higher. So just understand that. Uh, there's an awesome JBF paper. Uh, that I think is like 25 pages long, all about different funding sources. Uh, it was put together with InKind, uh, which is a funding source in itself, uh, but I want to give them credit for underwriting that work. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing that you should reference. Um, and uh, just want to spend, I think most of us are going to be in this sort of world of like bank debt, uh, just looking at uh, the team here um, put together uh, a, uh, information for us about how many uh, locations folks here have and how many people are like starting their first or have two or three. So I think most of us are living in this world of like SBA or conventional loans. Um, so just want to quickly hit on that. And again, happy to talk about it. I've, whatever scenario, I've probably done it. I haven't done the large multi-million dollar raise through a private equity, but I've done bank debt. I've done investor debt. I've done SBA. Uh, I've failed at a lot of things, so I'm happy to share that. Um, SBA is really like death by a thousand paper cuts. And it's more expensive. And they're going to want every single thing. Like, they'll want a second mortgage on your kid if you have kids. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you have a car and you have car debt, they'll want to take a second on your, they just want everything. Um, but they guarantee 75% of the loan roughly to the bank. So the banks are much more likely to make you an SBA size loan. Uh, I don't think, I think that if you're looking for 100,000 or less, like, going through that process is really painful. Uh, but I did it once on a $70,000 loan. So sometimes you have to. Uh, sometimes it's the only way the bank will bank you. Um, this last point, just landlords are a little bit more open now to making deals. Uh, not as much as we thought, I think, going into the pandemic. We thought they'd be just jumping. But uh, retail's really struggling, and restaurants are one of the few things that are working, and they're building, bringing people on the projects. And so there's a little bit more wiggle room. Again, they're very sophisticated people. They're not going to be giving much away for free, but I don't know. Some of them are, maybe. Um, so we're happy to talk about that, too. I almost said next slide, but I realize I'm holding this. Um, <laughs> this is really important. Um, and this will change over the course of your business career. Uh, so for me, uh, this is all about when to take finance and when to take your funding, right? Uh, a lot of it is how much risk you can live with. Uh, for me, I live with a very, very high level of risk. Most of you in the room, I think, are like very comfortable with risk. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this business. We wouldn't be talking about starting restaurants. Uh, and I realized at some point, hey, we put up about a third of the capital ourselves. Uh, for any deal, we're not funding it 100%. The deals that I funded at 95% like, just took five, seven years before they exploded because there was too much debt on them. Um, so nothing gets funded at like 90 or 95 percent debt anyway, and so I'm going to put up the first. I'm going to put up 30 percent. So I'm just going to put up the first third. What that does for us is I can get much further into the process and have a much better sense of how much the thing will cost. I personally stink at estimating. I've never done a budget for a restaurant that's been like right, uh, unfortunately. So I know that about myself. So now I just wait till later. Because what I was doing is I was working all these things simultaneously, getting the lease, getting the architect's designs, getting the bank funding. Uh, and then what I found out was I just didn't have enough money to finish the project. And then I had to go back and get a, a line of credit or call to my investors more money. And so that all was very painful. Uh, it's better to do it once you get open or once you have some things. So, um, so anyway, but uh, if you're not comfortable with that level of risk, like. We get into construction on our projects, and we close the loan. Like, I'm about to start training on a new restaurant on the 31st of this month, and we close the loan on like the 30th of last month. So it's a lot of like 
it's a lot of risk that you take waiting, but you also have a lot more information if you do wait. But that's an important thing to think about. Um, and you get a lot of your construction contingencies. If you can get through demo, you know a lot better how much things are going to cost, because you always discover things as you demo. Uh, this is really important, and I know Ping, I've been lucky enough to be on some panels with Ping, and we're on a panel again. Uh, she talks about this also, about how important it is to have multiple conversations at the same time. Uh, so that's one of the big takeaways. And then it's always, always, always takes longer than you think. The only way to get a bank to close something on, a, on your timeline is it's the end of the quarter or the end of the year, and they have some goal that they need to meet, and that's when they actually like push to get it done. Otherwise, it's like whatever you think it's going to take you, double or triple it in terms of just the time to get things done. Uh, things you'll need to apply for a loan are tax returns or copies of your extensions, uh, year-to-date financial statements. You'll need pro formas and balance sheets for your borrowing entities. Your CPA can help you with the balance sheet. Uh, if you don't know how to uh, create that. Uh, one very important point, uh, banks will stress test your financials. So what they'll do, really any investor, they'll take your P&L and they'll say, what if they overshoot their revenue estimate by a third? Let's see how things look. Uh, I'm not telling you to commit bank fraud, but I am telling you they're going to do that. <laughs> so what I do is I just adjust my numbers accordingly. I just know that somebody's going to hack them by 20 or 30 percent. I see Steven kind of smiling over there. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's my alarm to myself to stop and take questions, but I think I've got a couple more minutes before. Um, uh, so yeah, so I used to go with a very conservative estimate uh, that I felt very comfortable defending, and then I would get a call saying, hey, the underwriters ran a stress test, and this business doesn't really work. And so now I just go with my optimistic, knowing that they'll run the stress test, which then gets them to my base scenario. <laughs> Um, you will need a personal financial statement. Uh, you will likely end up applying for a lot of loans from a lot of different banks as you're starting things off. And so I just suggest making a spreadsheet and having your own personal financial statement because every bank will want you to fill out their own. But if you have your own, it's just a little hack. And I think it also s helps you present better. Um, and just having things for the bank quickly, I found like being very responsive helps. I will also say that the person that you meet with at the bank, unfortunately, is generally not the one who's making the decision about your loan. They're essentially a salesperson who's there to tell you yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then they generally package your loan up and send it to an underwriter, a group of underwriters who never get to meet you. There are some ways around it. I, I don't know if it's in this presentation or the next one, but we'll sort of talk about ways to get around that. It's typically the size of the bank and the type of bank. Uh, these are the things that you'll need to close a loan. I won't spend a ton of time on all this, except to just mention that uh, early in my career, every loan that I took, the bank wanted me to get life insurance uh, so that if I died, they got repaid. They weren't fooling around. Um, so uh, if you smoke cigarettes, maybe this is a good time to stop because your life insurance is going to be a lot less expensive as a non-smoker. And it may take like six months before it works its way out of your hair, which I think is how they <laughs> test it now. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, you'll get this deck. Um, just some terminology. Um, just know all the terminology and like drop some key terms with the people that you're meeting. It's just, it's, some, it's I hate to say it, but it's impressive and people judge you. They judge you on what you wear. They judge you on sort of what you say. Um, I didn't know a lot of this stuff. Like nobody should have any sort of feeling about how this looks. If it looks Greek, that's fine. Just sort of understand. I put it in buckets. So like these are the things that investors will versus lenders versus um, your landlords. Um, but I think the more sophisticated you present, so I opened my first restaurant when I was still 22 years old. It's actually just hit the anniversary. It was January 9th of 2001. And um, all I kept hearing from people was like, oh, it seems like you've really done your homework. I think that was like, because I look like a college student. But, um, <laughs> but it made me happy that I was like, OK, all these people feel like I'm showing up prepared. Uh, this is really sort of the main thing I want to go over. So. Um, be clear on define your North Star, right? So this is the sort of like a lot of chefs just want to go back to being a line cook. A lot of you that's, that are introduce yourself as I'm a chef or I'm a baker or I'm a pastry chef. Just, just be clear on what you want. If you don't want to administer the business and deal with HR and financing, make sure you have a partner that does. So you can focus on pastry or ice cream or baking or cooking or the thing that really animates you. Uh, because that's honestly what it's all about. Like the worst outcome 
is that you open a restaurant and you're successful and you're not doing any of the things that you actually enjoy doing. So I love people. Like I keep opening restaurants because I like people. I like seeing our people grow. I like creating opportunities for those people. Um, we just decided to close a restaurant. Part of it was because I kept saying, as long as there's a team of good people there that want to keep it going, and then like Domino's, like three or four of them gave me their notice within like a couple weeks of each other. And I thought, okay, well, I'm always saying like, I'll keep this going. It's not my hometown, it's a complicated business, but as long as there's a group of people that want to run it. So that was my North Star. And then when that North Star disappeared, you know, we had to make the difficult decision to close it. Uh, let me see how I am on time. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Who do you want to be accountable for? I think that's really important. So when you're thinking about investors, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the second thing. So I don't, I don't have a ton of, all my investors I know personally, and I like that. I know what their values are. At one point, we were thinking about taking a chunk of money from somebody to expand our cafe concept at Daily. Uh, and I put together a survey for them to fill out. It was just sort of like, one of the questions was who won the 2020 election? Like, I just want to know how, do we even look at the world the same way? Like, do I want to be accountable to this person? Do I want to write them a check when we, am I going to feel good about that? Um, so just to me, it's like, it was values. Like, there's plenty of people with money to want to invest. I think somebody said, think about what else they can bring. But also just think about who they are and how you're going to feel. Um, and then a really important is how much risk are you comfortable taking? So I'm comfortable taking a lot. I don't mind signing a personal guarantee. Um, I also will talk about this, is that here? Uh, okay, think about in advance about how you want to hold assets in your personal life. So uh, for the first 15 years of our restaurant ownership, all of the real estate was in my wife's name, all the restaurants were in my name. It was, we ran the restaurants together, we lived in the real estate together also, but we just segregated it. I, she never was a partner in the restaurant because we wanted her to hold the real estate and I could just say, you can't take a second. I don't actually own my house, it's my wife. Now, eventually people wised up and they said, your wife needs to also sign on the loan as a guarantor, <laughs> just so we feel more comfortable making you the loan. And this is one of the things, is like there's a lot of ways, I think part of why I've been lucky enough to come and speak is there's just a lot of ways to get things done. Uh, and so one of them is like, you know, if your partner has real estate, get her to sign a personal guarantee. Uh, but if you don't want to have that level of risk, if you sort of like, I don't feel, some people buy a house with cash. I mean, now I understand with mortgage rates, 7 or 8%, but some people buy a house with cash. I never understood that. When rates were like 3 4%, I was like, why would you not take a mortgage? They're like, I just don't want to have debt. So it's just sort of, they're good for them that they're clear and good for them that they had the kind of capital to buy a house. Um, but so just sort of know how you, who you are, how much risk you want to take, and then let that inform what sort of debt you want to take on. Uh, start with the least likely funder. I think that's really important. Like, go ahead and get your pitch. Practice your pitch with somebody who's going to say no. Like, no offense to them, and, and if they sub out a different name, especially if they help the James Beard Foundation. But like, Bank of America isn't funding any of our businesses. Like, n these big national banks, they're just not interested. It's just not their markets. Um, so that's who I would go to first. Right? Like, they're not going to say yes anyway, so let's figure out all the questions they're going to ask. Let's figure out all the holes in our pitch and then sort of work our way up. Um, you know, one of the other ideas I put is like start with your favorite funder. Uh, and um, I don't know if that was me or them, but uh, okay, I'll just hit one or two more points. Um, uh, I'll just hit one or two more points while we get that. So um, regional banks and local banks are great. Oh, we have it up on that one. Um, regional banks and local banks are great. I actually like purposely didn't invest too much time in the slides, so that, you know, don't feel, and you'll get them after. Um, and, uh, well, I didn't want the presentation, I wanted it to be a conversation rather than a presentation. And, and we'll go to conversation here in a minute and do some Q&A uh, if we have time. But um, non-bank, smaller lenders, sorry, smaller and regional lenders, local lenders, like typically the market president of a regional bank has up to $2 million or $3 million or $5 million lending authority in her name. So try to get a meeting with her. Right? Try to figure out who's the regional president, who's the president of the local bank. Get them into your restaurant. Get them in there on a Friday when it's busy. You know, I mean, just, just think about that. People thin slice. Like, wh whatever the first meeting is, however busy it is, the first time they'll come to your restaurant, they just assume it's always that. Right? People are always like, you're packed. Right? What are we thinking? Like, I'm packed because you eat at Friday night at 7 <laughs> o'clock, just like everybody else eats. Like, come on Tuesday at 5 and see how packed I am. Uh, but have your banker come in at, on Friday at 7. Um, community lenders are great. 
uh, they tend to have a different set of criteria. They want to fund uh, people who maybe don't have access to traditional funding. It is more expensive, that's this point. So just think about it as a bridge to a better deal. Think about it like sometimes you take a note that's not really what you want, but it's for two years or three years. Once you have two or three years of tax returns, you can go get a, a traditional loan. Most of these bankers will tell you, community lenders, they'll tell you, like, our best clients leave us. Like, it's a sad thing about their business. But, like, we hope you do really well, and then we hope you refinance your 9% debt with us into 6% debt with another. Um, people are investing in you, first and foremost, so just speak to your passion. And then uh, buying the real estate, look for the opportunities to buy. I've made more money investing in real estate than in a lot of restaurants that we had. And um, sorry, I need that to stop talking. I, I always joke that you just hit play and I'll just talk until you hit pause. So that's my pause button. Uh, so I just wanted to show you these, this scenario. So I'm a big fan and advocate of this 504 loan program that the SBA has. It lets you buy real estate. And also the really interesting thing about it is that it lets you finance all your soft costs, like architecture costs. And, uh, and any, um, you know, if you need any consultants, plus your equipment, plus everything, it all gets financed over 20 plus years. So you pay a lot more in interest over term, but your, your monthly note isn't that different. So I just gave you two scenarios. Like one is you lease a 2,500 square foot space $300 to build it out. It's a $750, 750K total sort of split with an equity and debt. And you basically end up at 10 grand a month. Okay? And this is like subject for, don't take this slide and make a decision based off of it. It's just a scenario, right? Here you buy the building for a million bucks. It's the same amount to build it out. So you have a total of 1.75 instead of 750. What you need for a 504 loan is 10%. So with 175,000, which is less than what I have sort of modeled that you'd raise here. Uh, now you're paying it for 22 years instead of, I think we probably did five years here. So, uh, you know, don't, it's not like it's only 4,000. It's only $4,000 more, but it's only for 17 years longer. But it lets you get into the real, it lets you get into the real estate. And then you have a real asset to borrow against, to sell one day, to transition out of, you know, it's like, it's a brutal business. It's for young people. Generally, young at heart, young in mind. Um, and so owning the real estate or buying into the real estate, and it doesn't have to be that you buy the building outright. Like the restaurant that we're getting ready to open next month, we bought 10% of the project. So um, it was $700,000 that the, they bought the, they bought an acre for 550. And uh, at the time that we bought in, they came to us, they wanted us to sign a lease. There's, they only had one tenant, they needed four total. So we said, OK, we're interested, but we want to be partners. There's three partners. You own 33% each. Why don't you each break off 3.33333333% and we'll own 10. And you all have 30. You won't even notice it. Like, what's the difference between 30 and 33? Uh, and really, honestly, smart landlords want you. Because you know what? Like, now I'm committed. And I went and helped them find the other tenants. And I'm talking to everybody about it even more than I would. And I'm going to be Ford Fry's landlord, which would be fun if any of you know Ford. Um, OK. That's it. Great. I don't know if we have time for questions, but like I said, I'm around and I'm happy to chat. We have time for a couple of questions. Couple questions. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, I what, what, um, what should we consider when we're looking at newer developments that are under construction um, in relation to securing financing? Uh, I don't know if you heard it yeah. back. What should we consider when looking at newer developments that are under construction? Yeah, so I think uh, one thing, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you for the question. So one thing is, I find that a lot of us, uh, myself, sort of primarily, I'm like, oh, you know, Elliot called me, and he's got this great site. And, and, and my, my wife is like my trusting mirror, and she's like, well, you never thought about going to Huntsville, Alabama. Like, why do you care? I'm like, oh, it seems great. It's mixed use. It's this and that. I mean, I think just one, just start with, like, does this work for my concept? I mean, honestly, the first Atlanta store that we did, I went into like a neighborhood that all my friends have restaurant that a lot of my friends have restaurants at. It's like very attractive. It's a buzzy neighborhood, but it's not the right demo for us. I mean, just I think start with that. Two, just understand how long it's going to take them. It's going to take a lot longer than they need, and make sure that your lease is structured. Like one of the things that we've started doing is our leases are now there's no dates in them. The dates are all based on when we get the space turned over and when certain criteria happens, and then we just start counting from there. Um, and 
Honestly, a lot of those things take longer, so you can be more ready when you start. Like a lot of those projects, they're sort of, you know, these bigger mixed use. Uh, so make sure that you negotiate that if you have six months, you have six months regardless. Because if you can start, if you can be ready to start, if they take longer and you can be ready to start as soon as possible, you may be able to get open. We opened one in like four months and had two months of free rent. That was 2022. That was the first time I've ever like had a restaurant that's open that's not paying rent. Mm. It was just because we, did the deal with the landlord that way. It was like six months and they wanted to say like, or when you get your CO, we're open for a bit. And we're like, no, you just give us six months. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Any other questions for Michael? Yes. The last three years, like for many restaurants, our P&L has been really kind of full yes. and weird. And a lot of banks are now like risk adverse. Um, what, what are tips for navigating these times? Um, yeah. Thanks for navigating these times of up and down P&Ls of the last three years and a lot of unpredictability. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of banks will sort of throw out your 2020 or 2021 or they won't look at them as closely. I mean, if you have history before, it helps. I mean, banks are always risk averse. Like one of my strongest memories is like walking into a bank like early, like first loan and my, our banker introduced us to the bank's president, and he was like, oh, you guys aren't here to talk about a restaurant loan, are you? It was like the <laughs> opening, like, hey, nice to meet you. You're not here to talk about a restaurant loan. I was like, wow, this is not going to work. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was like, it's the first slide for a reason, right? Like, they'll only give you money if you prove you don't need it. I, I think just having this, having the narrative to explain it, and then just again, Everybody in this room is probably a better fit for a regional bank or a local bank. Uh, it doesn't need to be one branch, it could be 10 branches, but somebody like that, that has a person there that's willing to dig into your story and understand it. And oftentimes your banker will have an underwriter, like our banker in Nashville has a specific underwriter that they know they have better, more productive conversations with. And so part of what takes longer for us to get a loan in Nashville is like, I need my banker and the right underwriter to just sync uh, before, so yeah, just having having easy sound bites to explain those things. But they know, they know that you're, yeah. Yeah, I just want to add something about, depending upon the amount of money that people don't, that you need, that people don't usually, usually utilize is the line of credits, right? You have to be very diligent because it's a line of credit, but because you don't have, you know, typically a line of credit, you don't have, you know, they, they mature like in a year, you don't have to pay it to interest only. Yeah. But like a lot of times you could go to the bank at the branch level, right? Where you do your banking, because they have your cash. They're doing all your cash management. So sometimes if you need like 200,000, right? 200 to 400, I, I just did with a client, they needed 400, they had a, like something you know, from an expansion perspective. And we did it at the branch level and you don't have to go through yeah. all those hoops. Because again, they have your cash management, so they see what's going on. So that's just a little. Yeah, and I think yeah. asking those questions, like uh, Pinnacle, who banks us in, in Tennessee, like anything up to a certain amount, I think it's like half a million, they just have a different system that's like faster that they can run through. Um, so I think just sort of asking those questions. One more question, then we'll go on break. So um, you mentioned five to seven years as like the time frame for paying back. Right. Um, when we were raising money, it felt like there was a lot of it need to have re repayment in under four years. Do you think that's changed because of like just the financial environment? Okay, that's an awesome question. So she, uh, she said that when they're raising money, people were looking for a repayment period of four years. So what I found when we brought the daily to Atlanta, that's our fast casual cafe concept, and we plan to scale it there and perhaps beyond. And so we had some conversations with investors, and that's everything we heard was we're looking for a three to four year repayment. Um, and uh, candidly, we're not there. Yeah. We can't, you can't model out my business and see that you'll get paid back in three or four years, right? So some people would say, why even do it? You know, we had one cafe that we put in a museum, and that's what my banker was like, looking at these financials, like, why are you doing it? And, and I had a North Star. I was like, I want the Charleston Museum to have better food than caf the cafeteria food that they have now. But I also had a thesis that all the people on the board of the museum would buy wine from us, and that that would carry us. Now, in retrospect, I should have surveyed them or like made them commit to buying wine first uh, because we closed that location and we took like a half million dollar loss on it, candidly. Um, so sometimes that advice is like really useful for you to do a gut check as like, is this really worth doing? Uh, for me, I'm not like money doesn't drive me in the same extent as it does the people who may look at it. Now, that's probably a fault. 
Uh, or I need some people around me on the team that sort of balance that out, maybe part of why we hired Steph, <laughs> Stephanie. But, um, but yeah, I, we just can't get there. So a bank is going to look for repayment in five to seven years. Uh, investor, from my experience, investors may want four years. Yeah. We were able to negotiate a different preferred return to model something that was more, their risk was mitigated more, but we had to, they had to accept a lower return rate on the Return, yeah, but that's what we ultimately agreed to. I think that that point, I'll leave with that point because I think so much of, and we'll talk about this with in the panel of ping, is um, understanding what the person wants and what drives them. Is it an ego thing? Is it a total return? Is it lowering their risk? And then solving for that because there's just a lot of different ways you can structure a deal, right? They can, you can own 51%, they can get 95% of the cash coming out of it until they're repaid back. You can, if you care about control and they care about just getting paid back as fast as possible, you can structure it like that. So, but yeah, I, I think that's an important note. And when you're modeling, when you're doing that analysis that uh, Stephen and Stephanie talked about, um, knowing that a private investors will probably be looking for a three or four year, at least sophisticated restaurant investors, people like Jen, who's been on a lot of well panels, you all probably know, um, they look for that short of a return. So thank you all again. Thanks for coming. Thank you.